Welcome to LifeSpring Church's YouTube channel. We hope you enjoy Sunday's message. To find out more about us, please head to www.lifespringchurch.org.uk. Point of the main message that I've got to bring, but um, I was just stirred again this morning. Um, my wife's name is Anita. Um, she used to work with some of you who have been involved in street pastors, and uh, 12 years ago, she was diagnosed with breast cancer, and um, it was a Wednesday afternoon, and I was at home, and every Wednesday afternoon, I'd take time out to pray by name for every person in our church. And as I was praying, God led me to Psalm 112, where it says this, Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. Listen to these three words. In the end, in the end... They will look in triumph on their foes. I read that line, they will have no fear of bad news, five minutes before Anita rang me from the Royal Berkshire Hospital to say, you need to come down to the hospital. That, that lump that I have in my breast is breast cancer, and it's not good news, it's a high-grade one. But five minutes before, God had prepared me. Uh, and of course... I felt emotional, we felt upset, we went through all the human feelings, but I knew that I knew that I knew that in the end I'd have no, no need to fear bad news. And the, the whole premise of these scriptures is that what the enemy intends to harm, God turns to good for the saving of many lives. Yours and my story, our pain, is used by God in a transformative kind of way for, for other people's benefit often. That 12-year journey took us through chemotherapy, radiotherapy, mastectomy, a breast reconstruction that went wrong. The consultant had never done a breast, consult, uh, a breast reconstruction that had gone wrong. It had to be removed. A whole lot of stuff around that. This April, Anita got the courage to have another mastectomy. And two weeks ago, Tuesday, that operation, the, the final details around it, if you've had a mastectomy, you know what we're I'm talking about. Um, or reconstruction she was uh, she had surgery and she is now well <laughs> she's now I, I'm amazed what's what doctors and surgeons can do it's just remarkable uh, and she's been restored in many senses as a woman of God physically spiritually and now we're going in some into some emotional restoral as well um, there's been other aspects of our lives that have been hugely testing my son-in-law was an ex-yodel resident he died six years ago and we looked after our grandchildren for four and a half years um, and the second uh, restoration operation that Anita had in April led to them going back home and we've now just about entering a new season but in all of that you kind of think to yourself our declaration all the way through this is God is good all of the time despite my circumstances despite our circumstances you know sometimes I think it helps in our connection with people who are struggling in our world to know that we've walked through the valley, that we've walked through Psalm 23. You know, God sometimes disrupts, allows our lives to be disruptive, uh, disrupted. And now you have to be careful here because I think, you know, we, we, we know what the, the power of the enemy, but God allows our lives sometimes to be disrupted so that our stories are much more than words. Everything in our lives is redeemed everything is redeemed everything is useful to the holy spirit and if we can walk through the valleys knowing that god is with us that he's the god who prepares a table in the presence of our enemies he gives us a feast when we feel like we're just picking at the crumbs on the table he is with us and he's been with us through this i, I went to take um, an alpha introduction evening out at springwater church in uh, peppard and um <clears throat> I sat down as I arrived and a woman came up to me and said, I, I don't know what I'm doing here this evening, um, but you know, my daughter's got brittle asthma. I've just been diagnosed with breast cancer. What on earth am I doing here? What has God got to say to me? And I turned around to her and said, we've walked exactly through that path. I've had a teenage daughter who's gone through years of brittle asthma. My wife's just gone through breast cancer issues. And she sat there like this going, 
and I was able to speak into her life and uh, I, d- I don't know the end of the story I'd love to be able to tell you, tell you that she received Jesus and she's walking with God and I trust that's the case but certainly God has got her attention good well now let's get on to what I'm um, really here to talk about <laughs> I hope that's helpful for you particularly if you're going through difficult times to know that God is with you he's with you in the valley and I believe that across Reading as we continue to journey on this transformation journey our lives being transformed through walking through tough times has a massive massive effect on the lives of others because we're not seen as Christians who've got our lives all together but what we have got is Jesus with us we've got a future hope we've got a joy in the suffering and I have to say one of the main things that got us through that gets us through is worship when I worship with the body of Christ when I'm worshiping with you guys today everything else finds its right perspective if the king is at the center so can we have the um, um, slides up <coughs> have you heard of John Wesley pretty great man of God but he got one thing wrong he got one thing wrong he said this <laughs> And I have to put it into context. I believe he said this on the back of saying, Reading is such a divided town, nothing any good will ever come out of Reading. That's not a photograph of him in Reading, by the way. Um, But he said that, nothing any good will ever come out of Reading. And um, I have to say, I was born in Reading. Neville and I are are, are some of the longest serving pastors in our town. I think it's about 38 years now. It's a long time, isn't it? It's unusual to be in one town as a pastor. But, you know, I, I believe God has orchestrated things in Reading. So there are our, not, not just pastors, but there are leaders in all sorts of walks of life who have been around a long time, who have become good friends and have become honouring friends uh, and are helping to form a foundation for what God is doing in Reading. And I don't know how you feel about living in Reading. When I say Reading, I'm talking about the RG postcode in its widest sense. Reading is a very, very special place to be living in right now. God is doing something special in our town. The signs are are here if we could only see them. Um, I was at a conference in Washington just before Christmas with leaders from 140 towns and cities, several thousand people, all doing the same kind of things that are beginning to happen in Reading. And I can tell you this, it's very, very exciting to be living in Reading right now. it go it's just the next button is it it's gone good who knows that the book of Ephesians is all about life transformation it's all about life transformation Ed Silvoso says that if you want to get to grips with anything in terms of city transformation embed the words of the book of Ephesians into your hearts and into your minds it's a wonderful, wonderful book, starting with uh, how God has chosen us in him, how his grace has saved us. It's all by grace. It goes on to talk about how the church, which we're going to look at that verse in a moment, talks about Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church that will be overwhelmed by the love of Jesus. It talks about how unity comes in the church through the wonderful gifts of the ascended Christ, the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers and evangelists. It talks about home life, talks about worship, talks about life in moderation, talks about husband-wife relationships, how to bring up children, talks about spiritual warfare and all of that. It's a book about transformation. As we soak that in and as we live what it says we can't help but to experience transformation in our own lives but also in our particular world where you work where you live where you serve where you do your leisure and uh, it's Ephesians 3 10 to 11 that we're going to look at there to wave it in the air I think his intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. If that's God's intention, is it going to happen? It is, isn't it? He's spoken it. He's put it out there. Uh, And it's a mystery to me because 
I, I like uh, Nev Neville as a pastor church for a long, long time. And uh, we, can, we, are, we are gobsmacked, gobsmacked at the mystery that he has chosen ordinary people like you and me who kind of sometimes muddle along to bring the manifold wisdom of God into all areas of life affecting the spiritual life in the heavenlies as well. So when you go to work, do you realize that's what you're doing? That is what you're doing. That's who you're called to be. That is why the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, transforming us, freeing us from shame and guilt and doubt and all those things. Not just, it is because he loves us and wants us to be whole, of course, but it's so that we can be men and women who bring transformation. At the end of Psalm 23, it says, Surely goodness and mercy will what? Follow me all the days of my life. When you go into a room, do you know you are bringing goodness and mercy? You are bringing the kingdom of God into your context. Your calling in life is a high calling, whatever you're doing. Because if God's called you as a mother, wherever it is, as a worker, in education, in health, wherever it is, it's a high calling. So his intention is now through the church. There is no plan B. It's through us. We could turn around and say to each other now, it's through us. <laughs> it's through us. It is through us. Do you believe it? You better believe it, because that's God's plan. And he's actually gone ahead of us. Um, at a church very near you this week, <laughs> you recognize that building? <laughs> Downstairs. Um, this guy, Roger Allen, um, works for a similar kind of organization as what is actually becoming in Reading. We're moving on from Reading Christian Network to transform Reading to reflect more accurate, accurately what God's called us to do and to be. Roger Allen came and he came to tell us something of the Bristol story. So the room downstairs was packed with 50 leaders of churches and different organizations across Reading. And by the way, it's such a joy to receive your hospitality. Absolutely incredible, wonderful food. And God can't help but bless the generosity that you're serving the rest of the town with. So thank you for that. But it's also a, bl a great blessing to sit around tables with men and women who are doing the same thing in all walks of life around our town. It's kind of hidden away from many people. And our goal within Transform Reading is to kind of present this story so that you can actually engage with it even more and feel part of it. Well, Roger came to tell us something of the Bristol story. And, and again, he was effectively telling us how... Um, God has chosen the church to do all these wonderful things. And what they've realized in Bristol, in every area of community life, whether that's sports, education, health, politics, creativity, as they've uh, encouraged men and women to get positioned in these areas of life, they've realized that God has gone before them. Isn't that good? God has gone before them, and he's put key men and women in positions of authority, if not Christians, men and women of peace men and women of peace and God is beginning to do some wonderful things in Bristol and you know that story is being re repeated in Teesside in Stoke in many many different parts of our nation and we're part of this exciting adventure we are moving together to another level I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment but all of this is something that's being built on foundations that have been dug many many years ago uh, Mount Pierce and others from Life Spring Church were involved in something called the Boiler Room. The Boiler Room is probably going to prove to be more significant than we realize. You know what's built on the Boiler Room now, don't you? The Blade. When the Blade was first opened, um, leaders from Reading Christian Network were invited to go onto the top floor and pray over Reading. It's probably the best view of Reading you can get from the top of the Blade. You can see everywhere down to the Medeski Stadium in every direction. And, you know, it was remarkable to be able to pray there. On October the 9th, I think it is, we've been invited to go back and to pray on top of that building. And it somehow feels that God is joining up all the dots, the prophetic dots that he's sown through the history of our town. Neville and I started meeting together probably at least 35 years ago to pray for our town with other pastors and you kind of think back and you think, I think that was significant. I think when we found each other all those years ago, that was significant for what God is doing today. 
if you stop to think that what we're doing today is not only significant for the next few months, but for the next generation. What we're investing to, into is not just for now, it's not just for next week or next year, it's actually for the future. We're laying foundations for the future. I found myself um, this year waking up early in the morning and I've got quite annoyed about this because by the end of the day I feel really wa washed out. But as I've woken up, I've learned that actually sometimes God just wants me to do a Samuel and say, it's me Lord, speak to me. <laughs> I'm here. I wish I wasn't. I wish I was asleep. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm awake, so you may as well speak to me. And I may as well pray. You know, I'm, I'm a really courageous, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a really, you know, leader who's up at, the, up at dawn and praying. Now, I, I, I'd rather be asleep some mornings, but God's been waking me up in the morning. And many, many mornings, he's been whispering into my ear, uh, this word uplift 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 I've got a little bit tired of hearing it in one sense but I want to inspire you with it this morning so that's a bit of a challenge and I've just said I've been tired about it but uplift and I felt God saying this I'm bringing uplift into every area of your town uplift and I thought good that's good and I'll come on a little bit later on what uplift actually means. But uh, and very quickly, I had this kind of um, acrostic. And what I want to offer you this morning is some words around the word up to uplift. Who in the room knows that the enemy is frightened of the glory of God? Psalm 133 says that when God's people dwell together in unity, what does God command? He commands blessing. The enemy is petrified at the blessing of God. He doesn't much like it when you and I are getting healed and restored in Jesus, because that's God's intention. But he's even more frightened when we choose to live together in unity. That's why churches are so, so powerful when we choose to dwell together in unity. Honouring one another, speaking well of one another, only saying things to another person that we could say directly to them integrity, unity. I believe the Holy Spirit finds unity irresistible. He finds it irresistible. He can't help but say the glory of God. You remember what Jesus prayed in John 17? Pray that they might be one even as... That's shocking. What a shocking prayer. Do you want to be the answer to the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ? I do, and I want to be in Reading. You know, what's in my heart? I, I love Brookside Church, but even more in my heart is the church in Reading now. My heart's longing is to see the body of Christ in Reading united. And we can only be united around, we're never going to get united around issues, but we can get united around a vision to see the life, love, and power of Jesus transforming people's lives. It's all about Jesus. He's where we find our real sense of unity. So unity is critical. We've had 22 years of praying within Reading Christian Network. The boiler room, I can't remember when the boiler room was going, but certainly at the start and maybe before then. And there's been a history of prayer from various prayer groups and intercessory groups that are probably unknown to all of us. But on those foundations, God is bringing a depth of unity where leaders are beginning to love honor speak well and respect one another and the first question is no longer how big is your church what are the kind of things you're struggling with let's talk to one another about it let's pray for one another the prayer of agreement is so so powerful so for us to experience uplift there has to be unity there has to be unity and this is a real challenge in our nation right now isn't it polarization despair, frustration, political, I don't know what we could call it. Within the body of Christ, we can model something different and it will be seen. Um, I'm sorry, but I've chosen three Ps. <laughs> There's partnership. One of the great reasons for being here today and never being down at Brookside is it's a tangible expression of our partnership together. Partnering together. It was a real joy earlier this week on... Um, Monday morning to go down to Greyfriars with Malcolm, a lot of social action uh, men and women in Reading 
and to affirm them in their role as arrowheads, providing a way, providing a context for the rest of us to kind of join in. We're partnering together for the transformation of Reading. Isn't that good? It's not just me on my own. It's not just Brookside Church. It's the church in Reading. And I believe a lot of wonderful things are beginning to happen. I, I'm a ch- as uh, James said, I'm a chaplain at Reading Football Club. And on the back of this unity, we are having some amazing open doors. I sat down with the CEO at Reading Football Club uh, a little while ago, and he said to me, I've got, I've got to change the culture and values of this club back to where they were. Can you help me do that? Do you see yourself as a culture changer? I, I'm just Steve, who came out of school with very few qualifications, I am a nobody. I might be called a pastor and a leader, but actually I'm a nobody. But in the kingdom, that's good news, isn't it? Because God uses nobodies. God uses the weak and foolish things of this world. We know the rest of the story. And you'll find many nobodies in the Bible who are often described as bold and courageous men and women. (laughs) It's a bit of a paradox, but in the kingdom, that's how it works. So we're called to partner together to bring cultural change, to bring transformation in every part of life that we go to. Do you know you're a priest? Do you know what priests do? They represent God. They're like ambassadors. We represent God in our particular orbit or sphere. Wow. Brilliant. Prayer. Prayer is going. Prayer is the heartbeat of what God has been doing over many years. It's the basis of all we are in Reading. The boiler room was a wonderful example of that. Isn't it great that we've got 10 days of prayer coming up across Reading? <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's incredible that we're actually proposing to pray together for 10 days for our town. This is not for what we're going to get out of it. Well, it is actually. It totally is longer term. The praying itself might be tough, but we've got stamina, haven't we? and we've got a purpose, and we've got a vision, and we're going for transformation. So we will join together whenever we can to pray for Reading with Christians. Will God find that irresistible to bless? I think he will. I think he will, because we're praying together. And at the heart of our prayers, your kingdom come in Reading as it is in heaven. That's an awesome prayer, isn't it? That is an awesome prayer. Presence. I love what the 24-7 burn guys are doing in Reading. I've, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, worship team. It's just exceptional to be in this place and worshipping so wonderfully together. But, you know, you multiply that out across a town or a city or across a nation or across the nations where every community, every uh, minority group is included. And worship com- coming from that kind of context is wonderful because worship means the presence of God. It means the presence of God. God loves to inhabit what? The praises of his people. His people that are choosing to praise, choosing to worship, despite what they're going through. It's like the Holy Spirit says, I'm coming. You are not alone in this. I'm with you. The presence of God. That's the U and the P. L. Now here's our problem. Here's our problem. How many of you, how, many, how, many, how often do I do this? You enter into a conversation with someone and you forget to listen. It's like sometimes I'm preoccupied with the next thing I'm going to or the next thing I want to say and I don't really listen. And I find this is a problem in God's church. We're not great at listening. We need to learn how to listen. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to give us the ability to listen. In a busy life, I found one of the problems is that I become a bit of an adrenaline junkie. And I'm already thinking of the next thing I'm going to. And it's like, oh, God. Six weeks ago, Anita and I went off to a place in the Cotswolds, Charles Wickham House, that we used to go in Reading two years ago, just to take time out to listen. And hey, guess what? Do you know what we were meditating on for the three days? Psalm 23. (laughs) God disrupts our lives to get our attention. He does do that cultivating the ability to listen. I much prefer doing than listening. That's a problem, isn't it? Because I've got to learn to step back and to listen. To listen to what someone's really communicating to me and choosing. And it's a real, real discipline. But ask for God's help to be able to listen. 
one of the things Roger Allen from Bristol was saying to this week, they have all these plans, they're all doing all this stuff, but every decision they make, they stop and they say, now God, what have you got to say about this? What have you got to say? Listening to heaven. I'm so glad that I listened to heaven at the moment my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. So if I hadn't heard that, I'd have probably been a nervous wreck, really, and full of fear. So listening. Um, over, the, over recent years, within the network that we're all part of in Reading, we've learned to listen to the borough council. And that can be quite a challenge. <laughs> the reason that Street Pastors was born was because the borough council said there's a problem with the nighttime economy. We could do with people out there. So Street Pastors was born. The second question we asked them, what's your next biggest need? Uh, it's lonely old people. So en engaged befriending was formed, which links into the Link Visiting Scheme, which is now a national organization. It came from Wokingham. And the next thing that came along was one of the greatest needs we've got is fostering and adoption. So Home for Good was born. So suddenly, you see what's beginning to happen. We're starting to be good news in Reading instead of bad news. When you start being good news, what does that give you? That gives you opportunity. And I'm, it's easy for me to use a few words here. And if, you, if you're working like guys like Mount do with the council and the homeless, so that it's, it's a lot more complex than that. But the thing is, out of listening, we suddenly find a connection between what heaven is saying and doing and what the, what the council would like to see happening. Wouldn't it be great to be known as listening people in our town so that we can be good news? We can listen to the needs of people and respond because we have answers and solutions. How are we doing? I stands for influence. I've already um, alluded to the fact that you know, 1 Corinthians 1 talks about God using the weak and foolish things of this world. I'm in the process of writing a book. It's taking a long time, actually, because I'm too busy. <laughs> but it's, it's going to be called Influential Nobodies. And it's going to describe something of our story. God using the weak and foolish things of this world to confound the wise and the mighty. God is raising up men and women of influence in all walks of life. Every single one of you, if you love Jesus, you're a man and woman of influence. Do you believe it? It's easier to believe it here on a Sunday, isn't it, than it is on a Monday morning. Sometimes, somehow I kind of think we need to wake up in the morning and say to ourselves, I am a man or a woman of influence. I will go to wherever you send me. I might live out of my diary, but I want you to overwrite being led by the Spirit of God into every conversation, in every situation. I'm a man or woman of influence. My wife, Anita, is very bold and courageous compared with me. She was in uh, Boots a few weeks ago in uh, Silverdale Road in early. And one of the teaching staff at a local primary school came in and started talking to her and talked to her about her health problems. And Anita said, well, uh, do you want me to pray for you? And she said, oh, that would be nice. So she stood there, this, this lady, she's not a Christian, and held her hands out. And Anita was thinking, well, I didn't mean here now. I meant, you know, privately at home in a quiet place, not in the door of Boots in Silverdale Road. Anyway, she stood there, so Anita grabbed her and said, I'll pray for you now. So prayed for her, prayed for her healing. And slowly, since then, she's got beginning to get better and better and better and she started to see this lady reasonably regularly um, three weeks ago they, they met up and uh, this lady said we had a lot of different crises in our family my husband's just lost his job I'm not happy in my job um, she said uh, oh yeah we just got back off on holiday and there's a flood in our house the water's come through the roof and uh, life is really really difficult so I need to say well I'm really sorry that you've been through all of that. Do you want me to pray for you? Yes. So she stood up, adopted the pose. She hadn't been to church or anything, so she didn't know what the pose was. <laughs> she adopted the pose, grabbed Anita, and they prayed together. The next day, Anita was down in Aldi. We've got a nice new Aldi, haven't we, near where we live um, in, in, uh, early. Anita was in Aldi, and someone shouted out to her, Anita, how are you doing? And it was a guy that Anita worked for about 15 years ago who set up his own business um, doing enabling sports teaching in schools uh, and then he's had a conversation with him and uh, he, the long and the short of it is he had a job on offer so Anita said to him can I give you the name of my friend if she contacts you can you talk to her anyway she's now, been, she's now got a, jo a job with this guy this lady that Anita prayed for and she was able to connect this lady with this job 
Isn't that wonderful? And that's how it works as we listen and uh, we, we step into the influence that God has called us to have as men and women of God. Sometimes we think of ourselves as being so ign- insignificant, so useless, that we forget our God is bigger. Our God is mighty and he's called us and enabled us and empowered us to be men and women of influence, digging the nutrients of the kingdom into every walk of life when people don't even know what we're doing. That's how it works, and it all comes out of a heart of sacrifice. F is facilitate. Facilitate. So often, sadly in churches, and I've, I've, I've done this a lot, We'll get out our church-based ministries, our small groups, life groups, whatever, our leaders. We'll get out all these people, people that we're sending overseas, and we'll lay hands on them and pray for them and send them out. But we rarely do that with our doctors and our nurses and our teachers. Every one of us are involved in mission, aren't we? And all of us need to be sent out and facilitated by the leadership of the church, prayed for, affirmed, inspired, anointed, sent out that is being apostolic that is being apostolic an apostolic church is one that sends all of its members out to all sorts of places around the world locally nationally and internationally why to be good news uh, and bring the good news of the kingdom that's being apostolic so leadership that does that is apostolic leadership is prophetic leadership bringing the kingdom in that's facilitating the people of God, the priests and the kings. It's all about Jesus in the people, into all walks of life. And I, as a church leader, want to help other church leaders to reinforce this message, to empower everyone like you guys to be the priests and kings that God's called you to be. This is really exciting. Are you excited? I'm, I'm inspired by this stuff. And T is, of course, transformation. The Lord of the harvest sends his, his laborers out into the harvest field. That's what we're called to be praying for. Transformation is beginning to happen. Lives being transformed. And I think it works like this. As you invite the Holy Spirit to continually transform your life, as you're going through transformation, you bring transformation into the lives of others. We never stop being transformed, do we? If you think you've now arrived... In one sense, you haven't, because, and I haven't. My life is, can you, you know, just, just when I think I've learned something, God gives me a set of circumstances, I think, oh, I thought I'd, I thought I'd deal, with, deal with this one. <laughs> and there's another one. And in that transformation, I bring transformation. And it keeps me in, in humility. It keeps me in grace. Do you know what the word uplift actually means? This, this is the dictionary definition of uplift. It means this, and I was, I, I, I was really pleased to read this after I felt God speaking to me about it. It's the improvement of a person's moral or spiritual condition, a morally and spiritually uplifting experience through love. We should do that well, shouldn't we, as a church? <laughs> to help people have a better life. If you're in love with Jesus, you can't help but have a better life, ultimately. To boost, raise, elevate, edify, to inspire, lift, revive, gladden, inspire, and restore. I'm up for that, aren't you? I thought that was quite neat. You know, the the Holy Spirit gives you a word, and then you find out what it means. (laughs) And it means all these things that we long to see through the church of Jesus Christ. Chris Vallotton of Bethel Church said this only yesterday on, on, his, on uh, one of his messages. It troubles me that many people who claim to be Christians live with limited, powerless, finite thinking. How is this even possible? I mean, how do people who claim to have the creator of the universe living inside them, the mind of Christ thinking through them, and the spirit of God influencing the world around them, even have the nerve to think small? I like that. that. There's a challenge in there, isn't there? The king of all kings, the king of the universe, the mind of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit. Whether you like it or not, you are a world changer. You are a world changer. I am a world changer. I've been doing chaplaincy for 16 years at Reading Football Club. I think in the whole of that time, there's only two people I know who have come to faith 
indirectly or directly through my ministry. But what I've realized is that I have learned a lot in working in that environment. I have touched a lot of people's lives. I've lived as salt and light in that context and with other chaplains. And now I'm being asked to shape culture and values. I have to say it's only a matter of time before more and more men and women come to Jesus. And who knows what purpose God has got for that stadium. We had the call a few years ago. That was a little bit of a mixed event, but it was a prophetic pointer, I think, for what is to come. Filling that place. I feel quite emotional saying that now. Um, filling that place with God's people, calling out for the kingdom to come. Chris Vallotton says this at the end of his little notes. It should suffice to say that the most creative, inventive, ingenious, imaginative, inspired, brilliant, resourceful, innovative, advanced ideas should be flowing from the sons and daughters of God. How are you thinking of yourself this morning? So, time to finish off, isn't it? Two quick things in finishing off. You've got to know the, the love of Jesus to be able to give it away. That's integrity, isn't it? We are our message. It's not just about words, what I believe. It's what's going on in the depths of my being. People see us as we really are. I find it really sad sometimes when Christians get a bad press because they're speaking out against this, that, and all of this stuff, but they're not actually delivering the good news at the same time. You have to earn the right to have a voice by living the integrity of the gospel. And to do that, we must be daily overwhelmed by the love of the one who's given it all. And I want to read this prayer, and I'm going to read it from the Passion Translation that Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 3 when he said these words. You might want to close your eyes and imagine that he's praying these words over us now. So I kneel humbly in awe before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the perfect Father of every father and child in heaven and on the earth. And I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods through your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. Help us to be bold and courageous, Lord. Then, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life, Life Spring Church. Then you will be empowered to discover that every holy one, every holy one experiences the great magnitude of the astounding, astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measure that, you, that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. That's how transformation works. Extravagant love flowing to you and flowing from you. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all, for his miraculous power will constantly energize you. Now we offer up to God all the glorious praise that rises from every church in every generation through Jesus Christ, that all will all that will yet be manifest through time and eternity. Amen. Let's give God a little bit of imagination to work with. Because when we give him our imagination and we give him, give him our dreams that he's planted in us in the first place, then he does the abundantly more. And there's not one person in this room that he doesn't want to do abundantly more through. I'm going to make you a little offer today. I'm going to make you two little offers. If you don't know this Jesus who brings transformation, I would be delighted before I go home to just chat and pray for you. It's so important we give every man and every woman the opportunity to come to the one who's done it all and who loves us. When I was in Washington um, just before Christmas that I mentioned, I gathered together with leaders from around the globe 
and there was story after story after story repeating the kind of stories that are going on in Reading. There was one group from Hong Kong, a group of Christians who, Hong Kong is one of the most expensive places in the world to live. There's no chance of young people, it's a bit like Reading really, of young people getting onto the property market. But the local council are so impressed with local Christians, they've given them blocks of flats to do up to provide homes for people that don't have them. That's just in Hong Kong. We got back from, from the conference and of course all the troubles that have begun to kick off, so praying for people in Hong Kong. But as well at this conference, I, I got this anointing oil, it's frankincense and myrrh. And what I'd like to do today, for those who want it, I'd like to just anoint you with oil. And I'm not going to pray any words or say any words, but I believe that God has anointed you as part of the church in Reading to be men and women of tr who bring transformation. And I'd love to be part of just anointing you. And you've, you've, you've probably had prayers for this before, but it's just to anoint you in the name of Jesus that you will be increasingly fruitful as men and women of influence in your particular world. Um, I don't know the best way to do this, James, but can I leave that with you? <laughs> it's great to have, such, have someone that you can land <laughs> the processes on. So, Father, I, I just want to pray as we do this that you will pour out your anointing on every man, every woman, every boy, every girl in this church. Thank you so much for Life Spring Church. Thank you for its longevity. Thank you that these guys are about to celebrate 40 years. I remember preaching down at Prospect School in this church. Who might have imagined what was to come? And as this church engages with the rest of the church in Reading and its generosity, I pray that this, this, this room will not be big enough, will not be big enough for what you're going to do. Grow us all, stretch us all, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed Sunday's message as much as we did. To find out more about Lifespring Church, head to www.lifespringchurch.org.uk.